Welcome back to Gale Force Wins Season 2. Season 1 in 2021 consisted of 92 episodes and the stories have inspired a vast cross-section of people. The feedback that Alan and Jerry received daily was compelling and inspires us to bring so much more to you in 2022. Thank you to those that joined us in Season 1. We continue to explore the journeys of Canadians doing inspiring things. Well, it's not very often you get to talk to somebody who is so passionate and so excited about what they are doing. Uh, it's uh, rare to be in that conversation. And quite honestly, Chandra Kavanaugh is in the right place at the right time to excel healthcare innovation in Newfoundland and Labrador and put them on the globe. You need to pay attention to this podcast. You need to pay attention to Chandra Kavanaugh. She is one impressive person and the work she's doing is going to make a difference. Tune in. Well, welcome to another edition of Gale Force Wins. I'm Alan Dale and with me as always, my good buddy from the East End of St. John's, Jerry Carew. How are you, Jerry? Doing well. Um, Chandra had to put up with a little bit of technical difficulty. My headphones don't seem to be working, so I'm going without them. We'll see how that goes. I'm really looking forward to getting to know you. Um, I think what you're doing in terms of, you know, the innovative space, but particularly for health innovation, I think that's fascinating. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Can't wait to get in the conversation as well, Jerry. Uh, Chandra, we've had a lot of great, uh, interesting guests on, and I'm sure yours is going to be a story of inspiration, and I'm sure you're doing great things. I can't wait to dive right into it. So, Chandra, without further ado, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much for having me, gentlemen. I'm really, really excited. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so it's great to get to be on. So I'm Dr. Chandra Kavanaugh, and I'm the director of Bounce Health Innovation. Wow. So Chandra, tell us about you. Where are you from? Yeah, so a little bit from all over, but from here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I grew up in St. John's and went to high school in Gander. So moved to Gander when I was in the ninth grade, then came back to St. John's to do my undergraduate degree and did my master's and my PhD in Toronto. Wow. What brought you out to Gander? Good question. So my mom, I had a grew up with a single mom who tried lots of different careers in her life, finally ended up as a fishery officer. And so she moved us to Gander. She was actually a fishery officer in Glovertown, but thought what a sin to move my two little kids from St. John's to Glovertown. We're going to go for the big metropolis of Gander instead. So that's what brought us out there. <laughs> so a single mom, I bet a uh, hardworking mom, no doubt. Oh, I couldn't begin to tell you what a hardworking mom and really a trailblazer. So she began as a fishery officer when there were very, very few women um, in that position and has been a tremendous success, is highly, highly inspirational to me. So she's the kind of person who, whatever happens, uh, she rolls with it and she rolls with it in a tremendously positive way. So just a couple of examples, um, grew up as a single mom and did her very, very best by myself and my brother. Uh, she's been diagnosed with cancer twice uh, and has beaten it both times, has been in remission for over five years and uh, found out when she was 42 and her partner was 56 that she was pregnant with twins. So I have twin brothers who are 13 years old. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Moses. <laughs> yeah, wow. she's a pretty she's impressive very... lady. <laughs> wow, what an Absolutely, she sounds like an impressive woman for sure. And there's no doubt that you draw strength from her most every day, I bet. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of the really lovely things about getting to move home from Toronto to live here, especially because I just gave birth to my daughter, Moira. She's now nine months old and my mother lives here. She lives in Conception Harbor with her husband and my two little brothers. And we get to spend a lot of time together. So take a lot of inspiration from her as a role model in my career, but also as a mother now that I'm learning how to be a mother. 
uh, Chandra, I don't even know if we need to go much further in the podcast. What a beautiful story you've just told us. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't even gotten into it. No, no Jared. offense, but get your mother on the phone, will you? Let's just get her on. I know I should. And she's going to love this. As soon as I show her that I'm talking about her on this podcast. Oh, my God. You should see she's going to share it with all her friends on Facebook. I guarantee you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Well, that is, yeah. Thank you for sharing that about your, your family. Uh, Chandra, tell us a little bit about your academic journey. So you started at Memorial University. What was the first degree, did you say? So my first degree, actually all of my degrees, I did through philosophy departments. So I started in philosophy at Memorial University, and that's where I was first introduced to biomedical ethics. In fact, I studied uh, mental health ethics when I was there, and then did my master's in bioethics and moved on to do my PhD in bioethics. So always had a real interest in ethical questions more generally, but especially ethical questions about medicine and about healthcare. And it's funny because you mentioned you were going to ask me about my academic journey. And my academic journey is a little funny because I said that I uh, moved to Gander when I was in high school or just about to start high school. And I was very, let's say, uninspired by academics at the time. Um, and I found out and I, I have told my brothers this story and I, I kind of hesitate to tell it. But uh, I found out that you needed about a 75 average to get into MUN. And I found out I could go to school, you know, two or three times a month and get a 75 average. And so that's what I did in high school. Um, and then it was sort of the same thing in my first year or two university. I wasn't very inspired. I kind of was pipping off all the time. And then I found philosophy. And I was just so inspired by the deep questions that were being asked. I, I often will tell people that philosophical questions make my brain really itchy. So when it comes to, you know, how should a doctor treat their vulnerable patient? Um, how should we uh, get consent from children? Those kind of complex ethical questions really scratch me where I itch. And that's where I started, sort of started to become passionate about academics and went on to do my master's and, and, and full on through my PhD. So it took me a little while to warm up. But once I did, uh, I really, really wanted to stay. Well, I got to jump in there. I just want to say this, that it's, I find that very early in this conversation, very inspiring because, you know, I struggled in the academic world as well to, and I think it's important. I don't think there's so many people would not be willing to be authentic and share that. Um, you know, I have an 18 year old, he's struggling right now in his second semester of university to see that you struggled and now you have your PhD phenomenal. And I think people out there, young people studying need to know that it, it wasn't a breeze for everybody, right? No, I think you're absolutely right. And very intelligent, very hardworking people can have a difficult time doing well if you're not inspired by the subject matter. And so when I did my first two years of university, you know, I did English and I did geography and I did earth sciences and I tried biology and I tried a whole bunch of different things and none of it really spoke to me. And it wasn't until I found that thing that was able to scratch me where I itched that I could really focus on it and then almost hyper focus on it and really succeed. So, yeah, it's not. I mean, there are plenty of people out there who know exactly what they want to do right from the get go. Plenty of people out there who are good at whatever they try. Uh, that's not me. I'm bad at whatever I try, but I just work really hard at it. <laughs> uh, Chandra, do you, was there a, a moment that this, the switch went off for you in, in this or, or was it just a, a slow progression? Was there can you define a moment when it just said this is for me? Yeah, I think it was probably in my introduction to philosophy class. And I was so used to being in classes um, where I was kind of, you know, bored out of my tree. And at that time, people didn't really flick around on their phones. But if I had had a phone, I probably would have been flicking around on it. Um, and, and I wasn't uh, paying a lot of attention. And I was in uh, Seamus O'Neill's intro to philosophy class. And he was raising all of these kind of ethical issues, you know, talking about things 
things like the trolley problem. So there's a trolley and it's running toward uh, a single person who's tied to the tracks and it's your decision. Do you uh, pull the switch to make it run over one person or pull the switch to make it run over five people? Um, and started thinking about these kind of questions and like, well, what's the right thing to do? And what does it mean to be a good person? Um, and I started asking questions in that class and I had never raised my hand to ask a question before I rolled my eyes at the kids who raised their hands to ask <laughs> questions. So I think that was really where the switch flipped for me. I found the thing that made me want to participate, that made me want to ask questions and, uh, and philosophy was it. It must have been a wonderful feeling to find it. It was really, really great and almost a little bit of a relief because I think sometimes you are, especially in your first few years of university, or if you don't really know what you want to do with your life, it can feel like a lot of pressure. You know, people are always asking you what you want to be when you grow up, especially when you're 17, 18 years old. And if your answer is like, I don't really know, um, sometimes that can feel like an unaccessible or uh, unacceptable answer. Uh, so it was, it was a relief to me to say, hey, here's this thing that I can think about meaningfully that I can write about that I'm passionate about. And, and this is the thing that I'm kind of good at. And I felt like for a long time, maybe I was just a person who didn't have stuff that I was good at. So it was nice to be able to find that thing that was especially mine and I could succeed at. Yeah. But you not only did you find it, but you went on to become an expert in it like you, which is just amazing. So tell me then about the master's program. What was that like for you? Yeah, so that was very exciting um, because I had lived in Newfoundland and Labrador my entire life. I had traveled a little bit with my mom, but never lived anywhere else. Um, and then all of a sudden I got into uh, Ryerson University's Master's of Philosophy program, and I was going to have to move to Toronto. Um, and as you might imagine, a Newfoundland girl from a pretty small town, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to land in the plane and I'm going to get mugged immediately and I'm going to be in the big city. Uh, so I was very nervous. I actually had been accepted to the Master's of Philosophy program at Memorial University. And so had to make that decision of do I stay home where I know everyone? Um, or do I take a chance and do I move to the city? And so decided to move to Toronto. And it was the best decision I ever made. I loved the years that I lived in Toronto. Um, and I'm very lucky because my master's cohort uh, was very, very close knit. So we're still in touch, people who graduated that program at the same time as I did. And that was really where I started to move into the bioethics side of things. So I had that strong foundation in philosophy that I learned about at Memorial University. And from there, I thought it was these ethical questions, these healthcare related questions that I really found fascinating, in part because um, the kind of philosophy that's done in biomedical ethics is what we call practical philosophy. So it's immediate and it's applied. And I found sometimes you get into some of these metaphysical questions about what is it to be? And I was like, yeah, I don't know if that really, if I'm really so interested in that. But um, a woman in her third trimester, it, her life is in danger and she has to decide whether or not she's going to have a late term abortion. Like those are real questions that my colleagues were facing in real time. Um, and, and how do you make a decision like that? And it turns out that there are processes and procedures and things that you can do to make the right choice. And I found that incredibly compelling. What does it mean to make the right decision at possibly the hardest time in your life? Right. Oh, wow. And, and then I guess let's get into the PhD. <laughs> yeah. So then I had to decide, uh, do I want to go on to do the PhD? I was excited about the idea. Uh, the stats are not great. So uh, when it comes to PhDs in the humanities, masters almost always pay for themselves in terms of uh, what it is that you go on to do with your career. PhDs almost never do. So the thing about a PhD is it is four years and it is four very valuable years right at the beginning of your career. So if you're doing that PhD, what you're not doing is going out there and getting a job and moving up in your company and gaining all sorts of employment experience. So there's a huge opportunity cost to deciding to do your PhD. So I had to sort of think about and balance all those things. Uh, but I wasn't ready to stop asking questions just yet. And I knew that um, 
there was some value to having this practical and applied version of a philosophy PhD that there might not be in other kinds of humanities disciplines. And so decided to do it and saw it through and got some really, really amazing experiences out of it. So wrote a lot about disability. That was what I focused on. Uh, so got to think a lot about the kinds of things I was, I was passionate about and also got to do some work in an ethics institute in Australia. So that meant that I got to do some traveling, learn a little bit more about the world um, and couldn't be happier that I got to do that, especially when we look at COVID-19 world. You know, I got to travel all throughout Europe, Australia, and then hit Japan on my way home and very grateful that I got to do that before uh, everything changed with international travel. So when did the travel bug bite you because you were nervous to go to Toronto? <laughs> So I was, I was very nervous to go to Toronto. I always sort of dreamed a bit about travel. Um, my mom had taken me uh, traveling a little bit when I was younger. So she was involved in one of the things that she did before she really found her calling was she studied education. Um, and you may know that Memorial University has a campus in Harlow in England. And so she did a practicum, a teaching practicum there and brought me and my brother uh, when we were little kids. And so we spent some time in England and then had a little family holiday in Greece. So that was so exciting for me. I thought that it was amazing. I was about 11 at the time. Uh, so it was very formative. So I always thought that I would like to travel. And then when I started doing my master's in Toronto, um, there were a lot of opportunities to travel for conferences. So that's really where I got to start seeing a bit more of the world um, and took as much advantage of that as I could during my uh, academic years in my postgraduate degrees. So let me get this straight. This superhero mom of yours <laughs> took two little kids to England while she was studying. While she was studying totally on her own. Also between us and the listeners out there, no money, like no money at all to do this. Uh, one of the things that I remember from the trip that we had to Greece was in order. So we went to Greece. I want to say it was about April. So to Newfoundlander, Greece in April is, you know, balmy. It was warm. It was beautiful. To the Greeks, they thought we were insane. They saw us swimming in the ocean. They, you know, couldn't believe it. And so my mom, to save money, um, we camped in a tent for a little bit of the trip that we had. And we knew nothing about Greece. We knew nothing about, you know, what it was going to be like there. And I remember one night, it was like pouring down rain, thunder and lightning, and and there were dogs, like a pack of local dogs that was kind of sniffing around the tent and barking. And my mom the whole time was like, it's okay. It's okay. The dogs are here to protect us. They're good boys. They're going to protect us from the thunder and lightning. And we're little kids. We don't really know. We're like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, I find out years and years later, of course, she was terrified out of her mind, but would never have let us know that in a hundred years. Did you, uh, you didn't happen to see the show, The Durrells, did you by chance? No. Alan? No, I've not. Oh my God. All right. Whoever whoever's watching this that has seen the Durrells is now actually experiencing <laughs> that show. It's worth your while after this to Google it. Uh, I will. <laughs> anyway, a family go to Corfu and uh anyway, it's just it's you it you've almost played out that show. <laughs> uh, that's uh that's amazing and, and I love I, you, you, can, you, can, you can feel your passion for wanting to explore and travel and, and do these things. And your field of study is just so perfectly matched to the time we're in right now. Tell me about that. I mean, you must be thinking to yourself, I'm in the right place at the right time. Like, what must it be like to have the knowledge and in-depth understanding of medical ethics and, and as you as you so perfectly described in the moment we're in because hard decisions are being made I couldn't agree with you more. And I really thought about that and really felt for the ethicists and the professionals who needed to make decisions when they were doing things like putting plans in place um, if it was the case that they were gonna have to triage patients. So one of the things that ethicists across the country were doing were saying, well, what happens if our healthcare system gets overwhelmed, we don't have enough ventilators and we have to decide who do we turn away from the hospital and who do we help? And those are the fundamental kind of ethical questions that I spent my, 
early adulthood delving into to say, okay, there's going to come a point where there's a hundred ventilators and there's 200 patients and somebody's got to decide who gets one and who doesn't. And that's the work that ethicists are doing, or at least trying to help um, frontline workers make those kind of incredibly difficult decisions. So I really do feel like we've seen a ton of health ethics work played out in real time during the COVID-19 crisis. And talking about being sort of in the perfect place at the perfect time, I feel like that has happened to me a couple of times in my career. So for instance, just as I was finishing up my PhD, um, a role came available in health research ethics here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I applied to be the ethics officer for the Health Research Ethics Authority. So we oversee all of the research that happens involving human subjects in Newfoundland and Labrador. So if you want to do an experiment, if you want to do a clinical trial, if you want to try out a new healthcare technology on a human being, you have to make sure it's ethical first. So you had to go through this office. So as you might imagine, jobs in healthcare ethics, jobs in biomedical ethics, there's like four a year. And the idea that there would be one in Newfoundland and Labrador at the very time that I was getting ready to graduate with my PhD seemed impossible. <laughs> and then the same thing happened again when I applied for the position of director of Bounce Health Innovation. So at that time, I had a ton of experience with regulatory compliance. I had a ton of experience with really innovative healthcare ideas. And I also had started my own business um, developing mentorship programs. And so I had a little bit of this entrepreneurial experience. I had a bunch of healthcare and regulatory experience. And then there's this, hey, let's talk about healthcare entrepreneurs kind of job and felt again, incredibly lucky to have the perfect position land in my lap. And I often will say like, I don't want to share with my colleagues um, the number of jobs that I've applied for because I have colleagues, especially with their PhD in philosophy who apply for 800 jobs. Um, I applied for one job and then I got it. And then I applied for another job that I was perfect for. And I got that one too. So <laughs> I've been very, very fortunate. You're like the Forrest Gump of medical ethicist <laughs> finding yourself in the right place at the, it's fantastic have you ever been described that way before <laughs> no but i like it <laughs> alan's really good at uh, that kind of thing coming up with new <laughs> describing well things. you just yesterday you gave me the wit and grit thing so we'll get to that in a moment so that's a perfect segue into where you are now and what it is you're doing and why we should pay attention to that so tell us a little bit about where you are in the moment yeah, I would love to. So I am currently the director for Bounce Health Innovation. And Bounce is a kind of resource center incubator that supplies support for entrepreneurs in med tech and in health innovation. So med tech, that is medical technologies. So new technologies to help you take care of your health. So that's everything from, um, let's say, an app that helps you manage your diabetes to a new medical device, a new kind of hip that helps you walk and all kinds of different things. So we actually currently support 50 different partner companies in Newfoundland and Labrador um, that are focused on med tech and healthcare technology. And so if any of you have been paying attention to the, to the technology sector in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know that it is absolutely booming. Yeah. It's an incredible time for the sector right now. And it's a, an incredible time for entrepreneurs in Newfoundland and Labrador. And so we're in a position where we're able to take a kid with an idea, a physician, with an idea, a nurse with an idea, and take that idea and make it a business. So there's a million different examples I could give you of the phenomenal medical technology that Bounce is helping to support right now. Um, but one example would be one of our partner companies is Sparrow Acoustics. Sparrow Acoustics has created a kind of digital stethoscope. So you take your cell phone, you hold it up to your chest, and it records your breathing, it records your heart rate, and it can send in real time all of those recordings to your physician. It can also send them to your physician later on in the day. So your physician doesn't have to work their day around that. And then on top of that, uh, they're very interested in developing an AI where that information no longer needs to go to your doctor because the AI is going to say, oh, we heard this particular rhythm in your heart. You now, it's likely you have this issue. So actually some diagnostic work that's happening there as well. So in the world where it's very difficult to have, uh, you know, in-person clinic visits, having tools like that are fundamentally important. Like that's, uh, that's disruptive technology. When you talk about kind of, uh, you know, impacting the current healthcare model in that way, that's 
not only is it disruptive, but it's very, it has very positive outcomes for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Another technology um, that we've worked with is, and this is, uh, so this woman, Deanne McCarthy, she's incredible. If you ever get a chance to have her on your podcast, I highly recommend it. Um, so she's on the West coast of Newfoundland. She was working as an emergency room nurse, and she has this really amazing story that she tells about uh, a patient who came in, I believe it was a young man who had been hit by a car and he was unconscious and needed to be ventilated. We were talking about ventilators. And so, you know, she's looking after this patient for like six weeks. He's still unconscious. Um, and she's noticed that even after six weeks, he still has blood in his mouth. So when you put somebody on a ventilator, you've got all this stuff in your mouth. You can't really brush your teeth or, or clean out anything that's in there. So that means that it's very common to have ventilator related hospital acquired infections. You get all this bacteria that goes down this tube that's down your throat. You get hospital acquired pneumonia and people don't survive hospital acquired pneumonia. It's very dangerous. So she saw this and she was like, of course, you know, the classic entrepreneur, there has to be a better way. And so she developed her company, Swift Shore Innovations, which created a little mouthpiece that you hook onto a ventilator that allows you to fully clean the mouth of your patients. And what we're imagining is that this is going to prevent hospital acquired infection. This is going to save people's lives. And it's because she was working in the field. She saw a problem. She came up with a solution and then Bounce was able to say, we can help you turn that into a business. But it's yeah. one thing to see that. It's another thing to take the steps to make it become a reality. How, how does that work? How, how, how are the people coming to you and what is the impetus to get them to make this a reality? I couldn't agree with you more. It's a huge issue and it's part of the reason why Bounce exists. So what we found, especially our other ecosystem partners, so for instance, like the Genesis Center or the Memorial University Center for Entrepreneurship, is they found there were all these amazing, astounding medical technology ideas out there that were just dying on the vine. So people had great ideas. They said, there has to be a better way. This thing that I'm seeing in my work, this thing that I'm seeing as a patient is a huge problem and I have a solution. And then they didn't know where to go. You know, where do you go next? Who do you ask? Who do you pitch it to? How do you get money for it? All that kind of stuff. And so that's part of the reason why Bounce Health Innovation exists. So we exist to say, hey, you got an amazing idea. Come to us and we will hold your hand and step by step, we'll get this into the hands of patients. And so that's part of the reason why after only 18 months of what we call Bounce 2.0, we have almost, we have 49 right now. So almost 50 partner companies is because there were all these people out there saying, I have a genius idea and I just don't know what to do next. So as soon as Bounce started saying, hey, have a cool idea in med tech, contact us, people did. Chandra, are they coming in at the ideation stage or are they a little further along or where are they in their journey? That's a good question. It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. So we have people who are really at the pretty early ideation stage who say, I have a great idea and I don't know where to go next. But we have some people, I think about um, uh, Jason, who's one of our founders, who they've been working on this idea for 15 years and they can't get somebody to listen to them. And they have a prototype and they have 300 pages of drawings and they know exactly what they want to do. But the people who have a ton of experience in healthcare and healthcare related ideas, they aren't always business people as well. So often they need that kind of helping hand to get it started as a business, as opposed yeah. to it just living as an idea in their mind for a decade. Yeah. It's so let's unpack that for a second, because I'm sure that you've dove into that question before. I know a lot of physicians and, and not many of them are real business people. Why is that, do you think? I think it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we're good at what we're good at. So we have a lot of physicians who've studied for a very, very long time, who've been totally focused on patient care and being great doctors. And that doesn't allow a ton of room necessarily to also be a great entrepreneur or a great business person or a great marketing person and all those kinds of things. Right. So often we find we have people in the healthcare industry who are coming to us with amazing ideas who really just need to be um, sort of trained or in some cases just partnered with someone who has that other skill set that they need. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. That being said, there is definitely a subset of physicians and healthcare practitioners who are amazing business people. So right. I see that, especially with like 
family doctors, fee-for-service physicians, in lots of cases, they're kind of, sometimes against their will, running their own little business, right? So they often know a lot more about it um, than they give themselves credit for. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And you brought up another, you you made a, a comment uh, about the, the nurse out in the, the western part of Newfoundland there, and she said, there's got to be a better way. I mean, how many times must that be said in the healthcare system on a daily basis? There's got to be a better way. But kudos to her for taking it that one step further. And kudos to your organization for being there to catch them and say, OK, you're right. There is a better way. Now let's help you get there. So it's got to be exciting for you because that's Absolutely. happening all the time. Yes. And hitting on that theme of perfect timing, one of the reasons why um, historically it has been a little frustrating to work in health innovation and med tech is because the healthcare industry as a whole moves at a glacial pace. So uh, my partner is a physician. He has a pager. Like who else has a pager in this world other than physicians? Who else gets 10,000 faxes a day other than physicians? Like those are just obsolete technologies. But in the healthcare industry, things are approved so slowly, change happens so slowly that often it can feel sort of like you're pushing against a wall to try and get new technology in the door. That being said, COVID-19 came along and said, absolutely not. You're going to have to change everything. So one of the stats that kind of sticks in my head is prior to COVID-19, something like 3% of clinic visits were happening either on the phone or virtually. Um, At the height of COVID-19, 99% of clinic visits were happening that way. So all these physicians who said, nope, never, couldn't do a digital visit, it would never work. All these patients, Nan out in Galtus, who said, no way, I've got to drive into town to see my doctor. It's the only way they'll understand what's going on. They had to give it a try. And so did the uh, the RHA, so did the regional health authorities. And so I really think that COVID-19, as horrible as it has been, opened a ton of doors for medical technology and medical innovation. It forced people to give it a try. Yeah, it accelerated a lot of things. It certainly accelerated innovation and learning. In many cases, learning and the way we work. Uh, COVID, I think, you know, there's a, I don't even know there's a term for it. There must be by now, but there's got to be a silver lining to some of this COVID stuff um, that's been going on. But that's fascinating things that you described there. Talk about a couple more companies that jump to mind that are involved in Bounce, because they've got to be so many exciting things to talk about. Oh, yeah, there are a million amazing companies that we're working with. I think about um, AMP Health Innovation. So they have an app that helps you monitor your diabetes and also works to uh, use your sort of um, uh, your habits and the way that your brain works in order to be able to change the the things that you do change your behaviors. Uh, So one of the things that we all know is anybody who's tried to diet, anybody who's tried to lose weight, anybody who's tried to do some of these difficult, like maintaining a habit knows how difficult that can be. So their app really focuses on sort of tricking your brain into taking on a new habit and helping you to deal with your chronic illness by doing that. So they're really exciting. Uh, We have a company that was started by two students called Techniche who are looking at um, uh, digital emergency rooms. So um, one of the stories that Voloxin, who's one of the uh, founders, always tells is about how he broke his nose and went to the emergency room and he hung out in the emergency room for six hours. And there were all these people being seen who was like, is this really an emergency? Is this really an emergency? And he left after six hours and snapped his nose back into place and just said, like, forget this action. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and so he was inspired based on this experience to start a digital emergency room where it would help to sort people to say, you know, who's here to get a prescription refilled? Who's here because they need mental health assistance? Who's here for all these reasons that could be triaged to other places versus who really needs emergency medical care? So that's something that they've been working on. We have a surgeon who's come up with a new medical device that can help to hold the tiny bones of your foot in place. Uh, We have um, a therapist who's come up with uh, a number of different puzzles that you can play on your phone to help you manage your mental health. Um, I can just think of a million different examples. Um, but amazing. but all- amazing listening to you. You know, obviously you've got an awful lot of energy, but I have a feeling you feed off the energy of the of your clients as well. 
Absolutely. Um, and so I think when you're a person who sees every day in your work um, what the problems are or has seen as a patient what the problems are, you're really enlivened to how necessary these solutions are. So one of the things that I think about is um, when I had my daughter. So just nine months ago, I'm you know in the hospital and I'm giving birth and I'm terrified. I've never had a baby before. And you know everything goes tremendously well. <clears throat> and I'm being discharged from the hospital and the nurses tell me all these things about taking care of my baby. They even check my car seat to make sure that, that she's in there nice and tight. Um, meanwhile, and my apologies, gentlemen, but you are like wounded when you come out from having birth, you are, your body is in a very difficult condition. And basically I was handed a Perry bottle and sent on my way. So like a squirt bottle and nobody told me anything about how to care for my stitches, how to care for myself after this traumatic sort of phys physical experience. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our companies is actually working on patient medical education to say, you shouldn't be sent home like that. He had a similar experience after having um, a heart attack where he was sent home with a photocopy pamphlet of like, here's what you do to take care of yourself now. And instead he's working on a digital app that plays you videos and audio and plays little games and really teaches you how to care for yourself. So I think not only when you're a physician, or when you're somebody who's working in healthcare, are you passionate about solutions? But as a patient, sometimes you see how difficult things are and that makes you really passionate about how could we be doing this better? Yeah, you, might, you must have been in the hospital looking at all around you and thinking, this can be done better, this can be done. I can, this company can help here. <laughs> were, were you, so, were you so, <laughs> it's really funny that you say that, but I had this conversation with my OBGYN yeah. who um, handed me a black and white piece of paper where we were writing down things like, like information from my um, clinic visits that I then would take home with me that I then would bring back to the next clinic visit and she'd read it and she'd write something new on it. So I, a patient was responsible for maintaining this little bit of paper and remembering to bring it back. And I said, look, is there no digital way you guys could do this? Is there no better way? But I'm pretty sure I'm the most annoying patient in the world to have now because I'm constantly wondering if there could be a better way. Better way. Now, um, when we get into the innovation space, and especially I find in Newfoundland this to be true, uh, the collaboration between government academia and industry is very, very, it's, it's vital, but I find it's very effective in Newfoundland. Everybody seems to want to work together to see everybody benefit from the whole process. It's, I, I'm sure it exists in other places, but it really does exist well in Newfoundland, and that speaks to the people that are involved in it as well. Tell me a little bit about the importance of those three big pieces working together, government, academia, and industry. Absolutely. Alan, it's so funny that you mentioned that because that is our secret sauce here in Newfoundland mm -hmm. and Labrador. So one of the things that I say when I'm talking to companies and I'm trying to convince them to move their operations here to Newfoundland and Labrador, that's one of the things we want to do at Bounce is attract companies here, as well as growing the companies we already have. One of the things that I always say is um, because we're so small, we're very nimble and it is possible for me to get um, a minister and the CEO of Eastern Health and the president of MUN in a room together with a reasonable amount of notice. Try to do that in Ontario. Yeah. Try to do that in BC. Those right. things, it absolutely would never happen in a hundred years. So we really have an ecosystem here where people are communicative, where people are passionate about what's happening in the tech sector and people want to see you win. In Toronto, yeah. you're one of a million you know, startups. In Newfoundland and Labrador, you're precious to us and we want to see you succeed. So I think that's one of the very special things about the ecosystem that we have here is we have this tremendous sense of collaboration and we're all lifting each other up in a way that I think doesn't happen in other larger places. You hit the nail right on the head. You hit the nail right on the head. Newfoundlanders want to see each other 
thrive. They want to see each other do well. They do not want to hold themselves back. This province, there's something about it that's very special. The people are connected together and they want to see people do well. They want to see their neighbors do well. They want to see their province do well. And it's because of that, when you inject technology and innovation and you know, thought leaders like Vienna Timmons and in, into the conversation and, and yourself and, and the government. We had Andrew Parsons on who was just so passionate about every company he touched. When you put people like that in a room and you put that type of mentality of the people, you're guaranteed success. And people look at a company like Verifin, how did that happen? Well, it's pretty easy to see how it happened. Just go visit the place. You'll see. Talk to the people. That is the secret sauce, is it not? Jamie, yeah, you're getting I, Alan uh, all fired up here. He's he gets fired up, but he's really fired up here right now. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's something that makes us stand apart and makes us tremendously unique as a province. It makes us such a good place to decide to start your business. So I think a great example of that is at Eastern Health, they have this phenomenal innovation team. So this is a team of professionals who's focused on innovation and offer an opening into a live healthcare system. So they often call it their living lab program. Really? So that is that they are willing to treat the healthcare system as a place where they want to try and, and test new innovations um, and try to find that in any other province. Try to figure out the basic procurement model for a hospital. You won't even be able to find out who to call. But here at the Eastern, at either Eastern Health, there is a clear doorway. They're saying, come in, innovate here. Um, and then that gives these companies an opportunity to say, we made it work in Newfoundland and Labrador. We can make it work for you. Chandra, incredible. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm excited now about the things that you talk about. I'm excited about the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Tell me what's on the horizon, not only for Bounce Health Innovation, but what's on the horizon for you too. I'm excited to hear about it. So I think what's on the horizon for Bounce Health Innovation and for MedTech in Newfoundland and Labrador is that Newfoundland and Labrador is going to become a hub of early stage medical technology in North America and around the world. I think we are going to become a destination for early stage companies to come and test their technology. I think we are opening our doors to that. I think we're opening our economy to that. And I think that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are going to benefit not only economically, but in terms of their health. Because if what we're doing here is testing out the most cutting edge healthcare technologies, then Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are going to get to access those first. So I think that is what's going to happen for us. I think we are going to be a household name in medical technology around the world. And people are going to think of us as Silicon Harbor. Um, so that's what I think for MedTech. Uh, for me, I am, I've been at the helm of Bounce Health Innovation for 18 months. Um, and I look forward to many more years um, at Bounce Health Innovation. That being said, I'm a millennial, you know, I think in terms of about five years in my career, and then I'd be interested in moving on. Once Bounce, Bounce is my baby right now. So I have two babies. I have my baby Moira and I have Bounce. And so I feel like once um, Bounce has all of its programs in place and it's something that's easily replicable and you get a manager in to run things day to day, um, that's where I find uh, I... That's not my strong suit. So my strong suit is in right, starting right. something from nothing and building it from the ground up. And I often say there are people who are great at starting things and there are people who are great at managing things. And I'm a person who's great at starting things. So basically, as soon as something's up and running and successful, I'm like, bring on the next challenge. <laughs> so I'm, I think I'm still trying to figure out which one I am. Starting <laughs> and managing, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> Chandra, that is fantastic. And you're so right. There's people that want to build and build. And then there's people that are great at the operations of something. Mm -hmm. And the really smart folks, of, of which you're one of them, will know when it's time to move on and say, right, okay, I've built this. Time to hand it over to so-and-so to grow this thing in, in mm -hmm. the direction that, that I want it to go. Uh, but the way you've described Newfoundland as Silicon Harbor, is that your term? 
Not my term. Actually, there's a really amazing little documentary on CBC that features the Genesis Center and it's called Silicon Harbor. So okay. I absolutely recommend if you have a chance, take a look at it. And you'll notice that there's a bounce partner company, Nuclick Biologics, that is represented in that film. So they also amazing technology. They are able to test your gut microbiome to tell you about what kinds of things you should be eating or what kinds of things you should be doing in order to enhance your health. So we all hear about how your gut is your second brain, your gut flora is so important. Well, they can have a look at your gut flora and they can provide you with recommendations for how to live a healthier life. So check out Nucleic Biologics and uh, the Genesis Center being fe featured in Silicon Harbor. Okay, now I have one more question. I often ask my guests <laughs> this, and that is, you're coming in at 11 here, Chandra. You're coming in hard, fast, a lot of information flowing. What do you do to settle, to kind of gauge where you are in life and, 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 and how do you settle your mind? Because I'm curious because I'm racing right now and I'm just talking to you. I can only imagine what it must be like. <laughs> so go ahead. So that's a good question. It's not always easy for sure. Um, yeah. So I am this enthusiastic basically all of the time in my life. So it is something, sometimes I need to ratchet it back a little bit and I have trouble with that. Um, but I would say the thing that helps me focus most or the thing that helps me wind down um, is I'm a dancer. So I dance regularly um, and I find that physical exertion is a really great way of taking all of this kinetic energy and putting it into something that is tremendously exhausting. Uh, dance really works your body and it also really works your mind. Uh, so it's easy to come home after dance and then you can just spend some time chilling. I wish I actually was in a, a conversation with some of my colleagues recently where we talked about meditation. Um, and I hate meditation. I, it makes me furious. I'm so bad at it. Uh, anytime somebody's like, just, just don't think, just let the thoughts pass through. Just, I'm like, I'm trying so hard to not think and which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do in meditation. So meditation, it doesn't work for me. It just makes me angry, but dance, um, and being sort of working physically and mentally, um, and really exerting myself. I find that, uh, that really helps. But you, everybody needs that kind of outlet, don't they? Whether it's music or meditation or dance or, or whatever it is, people need that to, to, to balance themselves sometimes at the beginning, middle or end of the day. It's got, you got to try to fit it in there, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think otherwise you just you don't sleep, you spin out, you worry about the week to come and the week that happened prior. Um, so you definitely need something to be able to to wind down and calm your mind. Yeah, it's uh, this has been a wonderful, fast moving conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And you've had, I mean, a, a tremendous journey uh, academically, you know, uh, personally, you've got to travel, you can sense that excitement. What would a piece of advice be that you would leave the audience? That's such a good question. A piece of advice. I'm always tentative to give advice because I find that free advice is often uh, worth exactly what you pay for it. And people will tell you, oh, you know, you should do it that way or you should do it this way, which often amounts to um, you should do it the way that I did it. Uh, yeah. But that being said, I have found what's been very effective for me is setting a goal. So I set a goal in a very explicit way. And I think about it often daily, weekly, monthly. So I set a goal of having my PhD by the time that I was 30. I set a goal of leading a nonprofit organization. I set many goals um, and I do so explicitly and I think about them often. So I would say that one of the ways I was able to get to where I am in my career, which I'm very happy um, with where I am in my career, was by setting an explicit goal and doing something every day to work toward it. Chandra, the very first podcast that we had, 100 podcasts ago, I guess it was, or maybe more, Jerry, um, was a, a gentleman who sailed a 26-foot boat twice across the Atlantic Ocean, and he left the audience with the same uh, piece of advice, which was set a goal. And his was, you know, get through the next day and, you know, hit the wind. And the, but it was all about setting goals. And that's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it advice now. I, I don't know what to call it, but it's a wonderful thing that you're doing for yourself. Clearly, it's working. Jerry, your thoughts? 
Well, you know, <clears throat> you, you, you characterize this conversation as fast paced. Make no mistake, <laughs> it has been. And it's an absolute pleasure. You're very um, inspiring in and of yourself. Mm -hmm. But you also, when you start telling the stories of your clients and some of those, those ideas that you just threw out there that are not only just ideas anymore, they're actual businesses. Wow, like that was inspiring. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, something that you said at the very beginning, you've made my brain itchy and I'm gonna take that, I've got it written down here, I've got it circled. I love it. Keep making people's brains itchy, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, another uh, wonderful conversation on Gale Force wins. Um, here's a, a person that's clearly making a difference in everything she touches. Um, a goal setter, for sure. A hard worker, there's no doubt about it. And the hard work, we now know where that comes from. Credible mom. Uh, took you on an incredible journey, uh, not afraid of anything herself by the sounds of her, and pass that on to you who are going on to do such wonderful things for the province of Newfoundland and the world, because what happens in Newfoundland moves on to the rest of the globe. So you're a big part of that. And the best part about it is, there's no doubt you're passing all that on to Moira. So we've got a whole other generation to look forward to of this energy and this impact that can be made on the world around us. And I always leave the audience with my own takeaway. I won't call it advice today, but my own takeaway. And that is, quite honestly, the world needs more Chandra Kavanaugh. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds, W-I-N-S dot com.